All right, welcome back. Let's continue to talk about attitudes. And as we talk about persuasive communication, this time let's focus on the actual content of the message. So you'll recall that when we talk about persuasive communications, we know that they consist of three primary factors. So we discussed that persuasion can be boiled down to who says what to whom. So who, we're talking about the source of the message, what, we're talking about the content of the message, and to whom, we're talking about the audience to whom the message is actually directed. That means we're focusing on what a person actually says and how the person actually says it. And throughout this discussion, try to keep in mind that when stakes are high, when something is important, people process information via the central route, where only strong messages, messages that have a strong content, lead to persuasion. All right, well, as we focus on message content, let's discuss some informational strategies. These are simply strategies for crafting a persuasive appeal that can make it more likely for that persuasive message to be successful. So for example, is it more persuasive for a message to be long or to be short? Is it more persuasive for a message to be one-sided or two-sided? It would be nice if there was one simple answer but the real answer is that it depends. And the key thing is that it depends on how interested the intended audience is, how involved they're gonna be. Because we know if an issue is important and the audience is likely to be highly involved, then they'll process the message via the central route and they'll carefully scrutinize that message. But if not, if they're not gonna be highly involved, if it's not that important to them, they may pay less attention to the meat of the message particularly if the message is long, or if it's difficult to understand, or if they're pressed for time. In those situations, the audience may process the message via the peripheral route, which means they're gonna be more likely to be influenced by source characteristics that we discussed previously. So for example, they might be more influenced by if the person is likable, or they might be very influenced if the person is attractive, or they might be very influenced simply because the person providing the message was described as an expert. But message content matters too. So let's break down some of the general principles that we've learned that have been confirmed by research studies. So let's first discuss if a message is more likely to be persuasive if it's long or if it's short. One thing is really pretty clear. The length of the message is not gonna matter much. If the people are highly involved, if it's a very important issue, and thus they're gonna be processing that information via the central route. For these people, it doesn't matter if the message is long or if it's short, what really matters is what you say. And if the strength of that message is high, if it's a strong message with good solid arguments, then persuasion is likely to take place. But remember, not everybody is gonna scrutinize an argument very carefully. So what's interesting is that long messages may seem more valid to people who are processing information via the peripheral route. Because peripheral route processing pays attention to various rules of thumb and superficial characteristics, it's possible that these people are likely to say, wow, that person had such a long message, they had so much to say, they really have a strong argument. So in that situation, they're not necessarily paying attention to what is being said, but just that the person said a lot. And if they said a lot, it was probably important. Let me just give you a quick example. Imagine if a persuasive communication was structured this way and I'm a politician, and I say my plan is supported by nearly every senator in the state legislature. That message is short, it's sweet, it's powerful, it conveys a, a very important point. If nearly every senator is supporting my plan, it's probably a pretty strong plan. So people who are processing this information on the central route are likely to take notice. Now contrast that short, simple, powerful message with this one. What if I were to say, my plan is supported by Senator Stevens, and Senator Johnson favors my plan as well, and so does Senator Cox, and uh, Senator Jones, he's got great things to say about my plan, and indeed, Senator Field says that he's gonna support it as well. And I can go on and on and on, and actually, I can talk about every single senator who supports my plan. Now, if I were to do that, it's possible that people who are processing this information via the peripheral route will be very impressed. Because they'll say like, wow, this guy was talking forever about all these different senators who support his plan. That's really very impressive. 
And they're not necessarily thinking to themselves even what the message is. Instead, they're just relying on that basic rule of thumb. If someone just talked for a long time and they said a lot of stuff and they said that a lot of people support their ideas, they probably have a pretty good idea. I'm impressed, I'm persuaded. But we have to be careful because adding weak arguments to our message or adding redundant arguments to our message can actually dilute a message that started out very strong. And this is particularly true for people who are processing that message via the central route. So my point is that it's possible that this message right here might do well with people who are processing via the peripheral route simply because I'm gonna list a lot of different senators who support my plan. However, by adding senator after senator after senator, I'm really just adding redundant arguments. And people who are processing via the central route, they're not gonna be impressed. All they needed to know was this right here, that my plan is supported by nearly every senator in the state legislature. If I keep adding redundant information, I might actually weaken my message. Now here's another interesting and related point. People who are processing a persuasive appeal via the peripheral route, remember they're relying on basic rules of thumb. And the rule of thumb that we're talking about right now is the longer the message, the better it must be. The longer the message, the more important stuff that the person has to say. So sometimes I can add relatively weak arguments to a message and actually make those peripheral route processors more impressed. So imagine this example right here. Here I might be saying that my plan is supported by nearly every senator in the state legislature and by many city councilmen. Now, the whole idea that my plan is supported by city councilmen isn't necessarily really strong because city councilmen represent really small fish when we're talking about some policy that occurs at the state level. So although that additional, weaker information might make the message more persuasive to people processing on the peripheral route because they're simply counting the number of arguments, that type of message is not gonna make central route processors more impressed because all that they're gonna be queuing in on is the weaker information and overall the message might become diluted. So it's kind of an interesting example that more is not always better, particularly when it comes to central route processing. If you can stick with a short, very strong argument, that's probably what you want to do. All right, well, let's switch gears for a second and focus on this particular question. Is it more persuasive to have a one-sided argument or a two-sided argument? One general principle is that one-sided messages tend to resonate with your base and also potentially with people who are processing information via the peripheral route. Before we move on, let me just even make sure that you understand what I mean by a one-sided persuasive appeal or a two-sided persuasive appeal. A one-sided message is simply a persuasive communication that focuses on one side of the issue only. So they're structured as if our side of the debate has like all the right arguments and all the good points. And then their side of the debate has all the wrong arguments and all the weak points. Well, your base is likely to respond to that type of one-sided message because they agree with you already and they support you almost no matter what. And by the way, that's one reason that presidential candidates often speak in such extreme ways during the presidential primaries. At that point in the race for the presidency, they only need to convince their fellow Democrats or their fellow Republicans to support them. That's their base. But you know how this process works. After the primaries are over, all that's gonna remain is one Republican candidate and one Democratic candidate. And those two folks now need to gain the support of voters who are outside of their base. They now need support from people who are likely to see at least some good qualities in both candidates. So now when presenting arguments, the presidential candidates might want to have some messages that are somewhat more two-sided, such that they include a more fair and comprehensive discussion of the important issues. Because without that, central route processors are likely to see the candidate as extremely biased, and then they will likely discount what that candidate has to say. So you can see the process gets kind of complex. You know, persuasion's not easy. It's not easy to change people's minds. And we need to consider a lot of different factors. So when we're talking about these informational strategies right now, I think it's important to see that both long and short arguments can be persuasive and one-sided and two-sided arguments can both be persuasive. 
It just depends on the audience that we're talking to and how involved they are in the actual topic. All right, well, let's move along. Well, what we're doing right now is talking about the content of a persuasive appeal. So we're focusing on what people say and how they say it. So one good question that we can ask is, are first impressions or final arguments more influential? So if you are in some type of debate with somebody who has a conflicting view and you're trying to persuade some other people who are listening, is it better to speak first or is it better to speak last? Are people gonna be more likely to remember the initial things that they heard or are they gonna be most influenced by what they heard last? Well, it turns out that order can be actually relatively important. So the order in which a persuasive message is delivered can lead to either primacy effects or recency effects. And it really depends on the timing of the decision that the people in the audience are making. This table right here might help us better understand the results of this research. And this is based on a classic study from the 1950s. And in this research study, people were reading summaries of a court case. So they were reading about the two sides from this battle. So they get some information from the plaintiffs, and then they'd also get some information from the defendants. And they would read that information individually. And then later on, they had to decide which case was most persuasive. So if they were on a jury, who would they vote for? So let's just walk through the four different conditions that were tested. In the first condition, the subjects first read about the plaintiff's side of the case. And then they read about the defendant's side of the case. And then they waited about a week until they made their decision. And later on when they made their decision, the researchers found a primacy effect, such that it was that first set of messages from the plaintiffs that tended to be most persuasive. So after that one week delay, people forget quite a bit of information, but what seemed to be most top of mind or most influential was what they heard first. So we call that a primacy effect. It's in the second condition that you're gonna see the timing of the decision really plays a key role. So in this situation, the research subjects first heard about the arguments from the plaintiff. They then had to wait one week. So that's almost like for this trial, there was a delay. So they came back after a week and then they heard the arguments from the defendant. And it was at that point that they made a decision to determine who had the strongest case. Now in this situation, they found that the defendants had the strongest case. So the information that they heard most recently turned out to be most persuasive. That's why we call that a recency effect. So what's likely happening here is that the initial information that the subjects heard from the plaintiff's case somewhat lost its persuasive impact during that one week delay. And because the subjects were now just hearing today about the defendant's case, they were most persuaded by it when they had to make a decision right after hearing it. That's what a recency effect is. In this third condition, neither side ended up having an advantage if the subjects first heard about the plaintiff's case, and then immediately after they heard about the defendant's case, and then immediately after that they made a decision, there were really no differences in terms of which case they thought was stronger. And likewise, there seemed to be no timing advantage in this fourth condition, where the subjects first heard about the plaintiff's case, they then went through a one-week delay, they then came back and they heard about the defendant's case, and then again, they had a one-week delay, and then later on, they came back and made a decision. Well, in this situation, because there were delays after hearing both of the cases, the persuasive power of each communication somewhat lost effect, and therefore their decision did not favor one side over the other. It's kind of interesting to look at the results from this fourth condition and see how they apply to how we schedule conventions when there's gonna be a presidential election. So in that situation, one of the conventions needs to be scheduled first. Well, if you're one of those decision makers, you need to determine, do you really wanna fight for your convention to be first, or do you really wanna fight for your convention to be second? Well, the research would show that the timing being first or second really wouldn't influence the final decision because the way it usually works is one of the groups will have their convention, let's say it's the Democrats, and then some time goes by, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. And then the other group is gonna have their convention, let's say that's the Republicans. And then again, time goes by, maybe a series of weeks, and then we make a decision about who's gonna be president. Well, in those situations, there does not tend to be recency effects or primacy effects.
So in this situation, neither first impressions nor final arguments tend to give you an advantage. All right, well, let's wrap up this discussion by talking about message discrepancy. What we're trying to figure out here is how extreme should our persuasive messages be? Let's remind ourselves of this first. Persuasion is all about changing people's minds. And that's not an easy thing to do for a variety of reasons. So, for example, we know that people like to seek information that confirms their existing attitudes. And you might recall that's what confirmation bias is all about. We also know that people naturally defend their attitudes. Because remember, our attitudes are one key thing that comprise who we are. They're one key thing in defining who we are. And we don't want to give that up very easily. So, how discrepant should a persuasive message be from the audience's current position? Another way to think about this is, when trying to change someone's attitude, do we want to go for a subtle change, or do we really want to try to rock the person's world? So, for example, if I'm trying to convince a meat eater to become a vegetarian, I can try to convince that person to eat a little less meat. You know, perhaps because I can convince them that it's uh, more healthy to eat less meat. Or I can try to convince them to eliminate meat altogether, not only because it's more healthy, but because farming animals destroys our environment, and because farming animals is cruel to the animals, and because it's morally wrong to take advantage of the animals by confining them and then by eating their babies. So you can see, based on that example, we have a lot of latitude in terms of how we craft our message. We can be relatively subtle and search for just a little bit of change, a little bit of persuasion, or we can be relatively heavy-handed and really try to seek significant persuasion, significant attitude change. So what would the research on this topic suggest that we do? Well, the bottom line is it's really best to be cautious because if we put too much pressure on someone, they're likely to outright reject our message altogether. In fact, if I were to plot message discrepancy and the level of persuasion on a graph, we'd probably find a very interesting pattern of results. In fact, it's likely to make what we call an inverted U. So let's make sure we can make sense of this. If I'm plotting persuasion on the graph, of course that can range from low to high. If it's low, I'm not gonna change people's attitudes very much. High persuasion would mean I'm very successful. I'm changing people's attitudes. Now let's look at the message discrepancy. If there's low message discrepancy, that means my persuasive appeal differs just a little bit from the target person's original attitude. But high message discrepancy means that my persuasive appeal differs quite a bit now from that person's initial attitude. So here's the bottom line. When I'm talking to that meat eater, if I were to give them a persuasive appeal that is not very discrepant from their initial attitude, but of course it, it differs a little bit, I'm gonna to try to convince them, for example, that they should just give up meat one day a week. If they give up meat one day a week, I'm gonna to try to convince them that they're gonna have a healthier diet overall. We can see in these situations when message discrepancy is relatively low, the success of persuasion is reasonably high. However, when message discrepancy is high, and I'm giving that person the hard sell, trying to get them to give up meat altogether, it's in those situations that the persuasion is likely to be low, and I'm unlikely to change their minds overall. Keep in mind that people don't appreciate being told that their current worldview is wrong. You know, you might be right, but they won't necessarily appreciate it, and they will likely resist it, at least initially. In fact, the more self-defining an issue is, the more resistant to persuasion your intended target will be. But let's be fair, there are individual differences in terms of how open-minded people will be. Some people will embrace a new chance to redefine themselves based on your unsolicited persuasive appeal, but most people won't. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.